Uh, am I gonna die? Hello, welcome back to Stetson Studio. With a little bit of foam board. And corrugated paper. And a song we don't talk about. We're on our way to making the colorful casita. So colorful, in fact, that it'll entirely drain your printer of ink. Very cool. One printer refill later, here's how big this magic miracle mansion will be. Perfectly scaled for running an Encanto encounter. The main ingredient is dollar store foam board, which needs a skin peel to expose its soft, fleshy interior. This batch had very tenacious skin grip, though. Usually it goes about like this. Times are changing. This foam board is going to make up all the walls of the house, but we need to imprint it with bumpy aluminum texture to simulate lumpy plaster texture. Rod rolling can only take the roughness so far though, but a nice tight ball can add the deeper randomness we need. With the foam properly lumped, let's start building the front door of Casita using an architectural process of vaguely holding a ruler up to make it seem like I'm measuring something. Yes, that's about right. Then we take those measurements and slice out approximately 100 rectangles of various sizes. One thing of note is I slice each wall that will join at a corner at a 45 degree angle to help hide the seam. More on that later. The doorway has a stone archway around it, which I made by lightly scoring the foam with a craft blade. Then I went back over each cut with a pencil to accentuate each line. Then I did the same thing for all the bricks before hot gluing together the aforementioned angled corners. For the door, you might think it would be tricky to get that rounded beam to wrap around the top, but if you cut balsa wood against the grain, it actually bends quite easily. Nice! Almost as easily as EVA crafting foam, which we'll use instead, but we can still make use of these wooden casualties for the wood slats that sit above the doorway. The rest of the wooden doorway is more wood that doesn't have to be curved into weird positions than the doorknob is an old earring back. Next we're moving up to the roof tiles with my old friend corrugated paper. Out of these offensively garish colors, we'll choose orange because it burns my retinas the least. Slice up a bunch of strips, and then let this bandage be a personal reminder to me to stop hanging my finger over the edge of the ruler. I'm pre-making a bunch of roof panels, but the secret trick is to angle each strip upward with hot glue so that the edge can take a dry brush easier when you're painting. And for the roof bones, the process is basically this. Start with a regular rectangle, then make it into a kind of a willy wonky hexagon, and then angle it up like this. Then just trim pieces of the roof panels to fit the roof skeleton, and it's basically done. But if you want to take it to that next level, borrow a few extra takeout straws to make those sturdy ridge tiles that overlap at each of the roof edges. Might as well prep a bunch just to be safe. And with the doorway done, that means we'll continue on with the rest of it. Starting with this block as we work our way backward. Once again, rectangle but with a couple holes blasted out for the interior wraparound deck that we'll build later. I'll be honest, my interior dimensions of Casita are totally made up and completely wrong because I mainly care about the exterior looking good, but if you need detailed blueprints there are 100,000 Minecraft Casitas out there with complete accuracy. For the roof trim on this section, and also every section, I'm whittling beams out of balsa wood then completing the inside of this block with just enough structure to add part of the interior walkway later. Quick crafting tip for you. Did you know pretty much every box comes with free creases that you can use for like roof ridges or anything really? Think of all the time you'll save. You don't have to fold your own cardboard. Hot glue. This big L completes the main structure of this block, but there's also this little friend hiding in the shadows down here, which I went ahead and made off camera since it's just a little guy. Now let's cross over to this flower tower over here, which belongs to Isabella, one of the members of the Madrigal family with a gift. She has the power to generate infinite flocking material without paying those hobby store prices. 
but Isabella isn't quite as powerful as these supporters on Patreon, whom this month took part in an art challenge to create something that expressed their own ideal gift or superpower that they have or wish they had. Kind of like the smattering of gifts and superpowers in the Madrigal family. These challenges are a new thing we've been doing over on Patreon, and they're pretty cool. Thanks for all your support and sending in your art, patrons. Now back over to the flower tower. The first step was to whip up this box and then stuff a tube in the corner to make this porthole thing. And here's a hot tip. I used the business end of a hot glue gun, sans glue, to create this nifty design that's decently close to the stonework design on Isabella's tower. And then four walls for Isabella's penthouse. <gasps> gotcha. You might notice that in a lot of these corners I have been adding corners, and that's because the corners add a lot of corner stability to cut down on general wobble. For many of the doors and windows, I glued a bunch of these thin balsa strips on paperboard to make these wood slat sheets to speed up making doors and windows on the fly. Then I capped it off with a cute pyramid head, but there are still a few other details on the front side of the tower. I stole these beads from Bill Making Stuff, thanks Bill. Then for the balcony railing, I have these fancy toothpicks, but all I need is the overly lathed end cap. I used every single one I had on this project. So now all I have left is a box of regular boring smooth toothpicks. Ugh, disgusting. We'll attach the balcony later after painting, but for now, this section is done before we turn it into a pink bouquet later. Below this tower of flower is another brick house. We'll just rough this out using such techniques as previously seen just minutes earlier. But the really important test is to make sure each section is properly balanced. Let's have a look. Nice. Once more for safety. Really happy we won't have to throw this section in the trash. And then one more little guy hiding back here. Speaking of little hiding guys, who are you? Based on how this section looks peeking out the top, I'm going to try to extrapolate what I think it looks like. Much like all the other sections so far, this section is also a vague rectangular tower, but with a notch cut out of the middle, which is where the interior walkway will pass through later. And for the roof, there's a notch cut out of the side, which is where we'll need a chimney. Oh cool, it's done. This was carved out of a singular piece of material, which is a technique I've seen some other creators use before. We'll tuck this here, but on the other side, there's one more generic rectangle that belongs to Luisa. Can't really see it from the front since it's being smothered by her sister Isabella's tower, but it's there under the surface doing a lot of heavy lifting for Casita. Uh oh, video out of order alert, but we do need to pop back out to the front side to build this balcony I forgot. It's pretty much the same as Isabella's fancy toothpick balcony from earlier, but as penance for suddenly making a non-sequential video, I will take this L. But this L is actually a special feature that enables a big W, which is a wraparound balcony. And now we come to Casita's last two sections, Abuela's Miracle Window and Bruno's Giant Green Tower. My best guess is that these sections also sit on a set of cuboids like the rest of the house. I made these off camera, but you can have these dimensions as a treat. On the first section is Abuela's room, which is sandwiched against the base of Bruno's tower. Abuela's room also has a window, and the observant amongst you might notice Casita actually has other windows, in fact. Most of these were made using the rounded end of these craft sticks and a chisel. We'll come back later to finish the exciting saga of windows, but for now, this is the one that will house Abuela's candle. For some extra wood detailing, I used these tiny clothespins, but pinched off just the pinching portion. These make for some nice ornate beams that line the edge of the roof tiles. Later we'll place the miracle of a magical LED behind this window, but for now, we'll set Abuela in her nook and slide her aside for her sun section. That's right, it's time for everyone's favorite anxious uncle. Bruno's tower needs four columns made from these cardboard tubes you might recognize, but we don't talk about poo though. Next I wrapped each tube in a piece of painter's tape to hide the cardboard seam, and capped off each end with a cute pink bead. 
From there, I built the tower up with pieces of foam board and insulation foam before closing up each corner with the ready-made columns. Until finally, the looming penthouse, which seems to have a waffle texture on the walls. That's the look we're going for. Foam melts at waffle iron temperature though, so try using a foam hot wire cutter instead by grazing the foam surface with just a gentle lamb's kiss. It was a little tricky to keep the lines even while going freehand, but it's close enough. Once you've completed what looks like an inverted padded room, the windows can be filled out with a tiny bit of cross stitch canvas grating. The trick is to keep your holes a little tight so you can get a nice snug pressure fit. To hide the seam between these sections, we'll need a few foam tombstones. Boo. Each of these has an archway cut out, as well as a little star-shaped asterisk window. You'll have to make four identical pieces, but one is bound to be uglier than the rest, so just hide that one on the back where no one will see it. And now, the cherry on top, which I'm pretty excited about because I have the perfect bit. Earring backs. Precariously stab a safety pin through the hole in the middle, narrowly missing your finger, and you'll have an almost film-accurate roof ornament. And that's the last section. Trick you, there's one more here that I just sort of made up to fill in a space left over in the back. It isn't in the movie, so please make up a new Madrigal that lives here in the comments below. And here's the complete Casita collection before we move on to adding texture. I want to emulate the texture you see on adobe walls, which is a material that actually starts its life as a goop. I'm using modeling paste as a goop base, baking soda for a little extra gritty texture, and water to thin it out until we have a nice slurpable yeah. The consistency should be thick, but still chuggable. Then, using a sponge while the goop glaze is still a bit damp, continuously pat with a stippling motion until the brush strokes are gone and the goop bumps are small. And don't be afraid to double fist the goop if you have some extra hands to help out. If your goop is too thick and starts to obscure detail, use a toothpick to scrape out your cracks. Or for especially messy holes filled with goop, a can of compressed air might work better. After a quick coat of white primer, it's looking almost exactly the same. Now let's take it over to the airbrush for some painting. I was just about ready to start, but then... Squirrel! Goodbye, friend. The first pass with the airbrush is a pre-shading step using black paint to add a shadow into the recesses where sunlight might not reach or would otherwise be blocked by other geometry on the model. If you're familiar with 3D modeling software, this is pretty similar to the look of turning up the ambient occlusion. And whoops, I ran out of black paint, so let's switch to brown, which in hindsight is actually better. This building will be painted yellow later, so the brown should make for a warmer shadow. Alright, pre-shading done. Now it's time to start layering on some color onto Casita. The house has an almost pastel scheme, so we'll mix these colors with white as needed. Using an eyedropper, I like to use this suck and squirt method until I have a nice smooth shade. Then I just start spraying in smooth, even passes, making sure not to completely cover up the pre-shading gradient from the previous step. But there are no laws here, I just keep going until it looks pretty good enough to my eyes. For areas where I would be especially bad at staying within the lines, I used some masking tape to preserve the white primer below. And with the wall base coats done, it's now roof time. The roof tiles are likely made of terracotta, so I painted them in terracotta. This lovely terracotta was also used for Casita's archway entry, as well as a family of similar hues for the various bricks around the house. Then I went back and cleaned up the bricks with white paint to act as the mortar. All the wood beams come in either two shades, a rusty red or a tasty turquoise. After the beams, this color was also used for the door, which was painted in black first to retain some darkness in the recesses. 
While staring at this, it started to bug me how the roof tiles were all one color, so let's spice it up with a couple of variations on terracotta. It took a couple hours, but the result now looks slightly less like just a sheet of corrugated paper. And now for this mac and cheese looking waffle on Bruno's tower, each of the tiles was painted in the ghost of avocado. Boo. Which was also dabbed, stippled, splotched, painted, and dry brushed across the whole tower for a bit of plaster wear and tear. Speaking of dry brushing, that goes for the whole casita, using appropriate colors that are a lighter version of whatever color they're being painted over. I finished up Bruno's tower with a silver hood ornament, then realized Isabella needs an ornament as well, using a piece of this Christmas tree bauble. Then I used a straw to paint these circular sections, and the result is a mess. But it doesn't matter, because this mess will be covered in flowers later. Because remember, if it's going to be hidden by another bit, then it's okay if it looks like not good. But do you know what does look good? This Rapunzel Tower from Disney's Tangled made by my bud Narb. I highly recommend a click after this to watch him build a screen accurate bigoture that towers over his three year old. It's a super impressive Disney build that required interrupting this video for. And now back to our feature presentation. Painting is just about done so let's take a short montage break while we install windows. Alright Mirabelle, what do we need next? Floor. And where do we keep that? Drawer. Oh right, my thing of mini decks. As they always say, you can never have too much deck, so here's a sheet of stained stirring sticks ready to go. And if you have extra, make sure you keep it for later. Using a fancy toothpick railing, let's fill in the last remaining gaps here. Then for Bruno, I bent some very beefy staples from armature wire to cage up his star holes. And now I'll stop talking so I don't ruin the assembly montage. And there it almost all is, except for Abuela. Because it's time to light the miracle candle, in which the real miracle is how I didn't end up catching the whole house on fire. Beautiful. Ouch! Instead of a fire hazard, we'll use this battery-powered dollar store tea light. For the candle itself, I used a nugget of paper straw and the tiniest dab of hot glue, which is used to secure another tiny dab of flame-shaped hot glue. After a quick pass of flame color, this magic candle is ready to shine eternal or for three to four hours when the battery is depleted. And of course, there's always one more thing I forgot, whoops. For the chimney and weather vane, I used metal beads, balsa wood, and a safety pin? No, a deluxe safety pin, Founders Edition. Beneath Casita is a whole lot of green, so let's build a big bushy base for this building. 
To sculpt this foam, I'm using a hot wire foam cutter, so it's important to grab some face protection because you don't want to be breathing in these hazardous fumes. This is my first time using this hot wire tool, and I must say it was very satisfying sculpting this generic and slightly sloped plateau. And there we go. Any lumpy imperfections don't really matter because the whole thing is going to be hidden under a blanket of various greenery. Mmm, delicious gelato. Before we get to the base, let's moss up the house using PVA glue and fine green flocking. This has the added benefit of filling in any egregious gaps, hiding messy paint jobs, or covering up hideous shingles. And through the magic of glue, any extra flocking can be brushed away and saved for another day. Alternatively, you can also just mix flocking turf with glue to make a green goop and brush it on directly, which is something I first saw on Black Magic Craft. Casita is looking completa, except there's a void where the floor should be. A printed floor is fine. The house and the base are collectively very light, so tacky glue along the edges should be enough to keep them together. Then for the ground form around the house, I'm mixing up a Boilai Hobby Time special of plaster, some dirty paint water, a couple really old creamy beiges, and a dripless pour of Mod Podge. You just pour and then you turn. Mix it up a bit, then try to show the camera without spilling, then mix up some more until it's a lumpy pancake batter. Spread that sauce nice and thick, and while it's still wet, lay down some pieces of tree bark as stones, and some stones as stones for the front walkway. After it's dry and looking like crusty earth, it's time for my favorite part. Using a static grass applicator to apply some static grass with the power of electricity. I just can't get enough of these tiny grass blades, they're just so cute. And then to add some variation to this unkempt lawn, I used some spray adhesive and sprinkled on a bit more flocking here and there. Bushes. I have these palm trees that cost money, and these sticks that cost nothing. And they're actually a big improvement. And if you're wondering why they're so tall, that's because the wax palms in Colombia are huge and absolutely rule. I gave it a trim and some highlights to really accentuate those dead damaged leaves and here's the new and improved grove. Most of these were jabbed wherever I felt like it, but these two in the front are specific movie tree placements, along with a few more finishing touches in front of these windows. But there's a disturbing lack of pink on the house thus far. First we'll bang out that tree next to the front door using a sticky stick dipped into my green clump foliage nugget box. The green is a nice base layer, but it needs a coat of pink flock, which I don't have. Yet. You can make your own clump flock using cheap sponges, which I first saw on the Terrain Tutor. Make sure you follow his tutorial and not mine, because what you shouldn't use is an electric grinder that isn't meant to hold water. Uh, too late now. Am I gonna die? If you do manage to avoid getting electrocuted, try using a blender next time. Any light colored sponge is good, but I had the luxury of starting with pink as a cheat code to make it easier to tint them to another shade of pink. Using about one part white glue to five parts paint, I mixed up a batch of pleasing pink and hot blinding magenta. And since there's glue in here, make sure to spread them around a bit while they dry. Back at Tree Town now, I frosted the tips in white glue, then dipped them deep in my pink pot. For Isabella's tower, we need a blanket of green before we can convert it to a pink palace. I attached a few green spiderwebs using this Hobby Store Vine product as a base layer. Then I was a nasty little freak and used the rest of the pink clumps I made. All done. Thanks for watching everyone. As always, I couldn't have done this without the support on Patreon and the slammers of the like and subscribe button. Until then, enjoy the Casita beauty shots and sing along if you know the words. Esme and Isaac Baroni, closure. 
Annie Kaleka, Jacob Thunderbird, Lindsay Gencash, Eclipse, Quirky Perceptions, Issa Farnik, Mighty Java's Collection, Megan Ray, Megan Earl, Rachel Cyril, Tim Triple Zero X, Three, Sir Bruce Abbey Woof, Ghostly Gardens, Nicole Nasili, Usman, Logan Hamilton, Madison Green Metal meets Art Chris Berklin, John J. R. Robeck, Space Cat One, Loose Goo Queen, MMCI One Five Two Five E Ten Tinsley, Cole Easy Shot Girl, Cult Bob Zori Lori, Abigail Katie, Matt and Agnes B, Sorry Inari, Carrie and Messi, Cubby, Stefan Bogdan, Alan Cassidy, Joe the Woodsman, Denture, Daddy, Bracken, Evie, Dylan, Mullaley, Luca, Luca, John Hill, April, W, EJ, Alco, Pinross, KL. Draw babies, Jaden Morgan, Mike Swan, Glenn Arthur, Annalise Braden, Leah Clark, and Zach Mother, Megan Walker, Sierra Mason, Joyous Waters, ZB Jason, it's not here. Michael Perrot, Glenn Weaver, Evan OCM, Lawrence Law, Jonathan Signaro, Chris Mudd, Michello, Merlin's Moth, Honey Banana, 